Thank you. Well, welcome everyone um, to the Complementary Currencies panel. I'm Alice Maggio. Um, I work at the Schumacher Center for New Economics in the Berkshires of Massachusetts. So I've come a long way to be here, and I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, we have Michael Barton from the North Shore Let System, Tata Magush, um, and Ryan Watson from CredX. Um, and he's also the Director of Finance at um, Shambhala, Shambhala. Shambhala uh, International, and um, has a, also a history of small business as an accountant. Um, and Grace Murray's here from Truro, um, the Downtown Truro Partnership, and she works on Downtown Truro Dollars. Um, so they're all going to give you um, a glimpse into what they do. I thought I'd start off with a kind of bigger picture view on money, and um, because it's something that we don't always question and think about uh, what underlies our system of money. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about our local currency in my area <coughs> before I turn it over to the panelists. So thanks for being here. Um, so we often don't really ask what is money because we just use it. Um, and we often use the same kind all the time, dollars. Um, and so I think it's sometimes it's, it's very worth asking some questions of our money because it is one of the major pieces of our, what it makes our economy go. And so if we want to change the way our economy works, we might need to change our money system. So what you traditionally hear when you ask what is money is that it's a means of exchange. So it's, an, it's a way of intermediating um, goods and, and services that one person has and another person needs or a whole system of people need. Um, and it's easier than using those goods to trade one for one because it's hard to find how many eggs equal a pound of pork. Uh, it's much easier to use dollars or money. Um, it's also a storage of value, something that can hold value that doesn't go bad. Um, and it's a unit of account that everybody understands to a certain extent how much it's worth. So that's kind of the traditional way of thinking about money. Um, but it also has, I think everybody could probably name a number of other facets that um, are incorporated into our money. So when you hand over cash to somebody, um, that's kind of creating a relationship. Um, what you have on that piece of money or um, this, the, the kind of money you use can be symbolic. Um, so we have our presidents on um, US <coughs> currency and um, you have the queen on your currency, on some of it at least. Um, so that, that represents something. Um, so, so money isn't just about um, means of exchange, unit of account, and storage of value. It can, and I would argue it can also be used, actually, as a tool for planning um, your economy. Because if you think about it, when you're investing money into something, you're giving money up front, and you're thinking about what's going to be used, what that money is going to be used for in the future. So you're planning your economy by making investments. Um, so basically, it's a tool. It's a human-created tool, which is something that I never really realized until I started working on Berkshires a couple years ago, um, that if you have a, if money is a tool, then that means we can change how that tool works, and we can all kind of design our own tools to do what we want. So then you have to ask, if you're designing something, you have to ask some questions. Um, what do you want those, what values do you want to incorporate into your tool? Um, what kind of economy do you want to create in the long run? What's your big vision? Uh, and then you want to ask, who's issuing the currency? How is it issued? What does it look like? Uh, when is it issued and why? So um, those are things that we don't have much control over if we're just using a uh, national currency because it's so far away. Those decisions are all made so far away from the everyday citizen um, that we don't have much control over it. Um, and that's been how our system has worked for a while now. Um, in the US, it's been mostly centralized issue of currency since 1913 when the Federal Reserve Act went into place. Um, but, and I, a lot of places have had centralized banking a lot longer than that. 
where the central bank gets to decide when to issue more money and why and how. Um, but there's, so, so basically what we have now is a monoculture of currency. And each, currency, each uh, country has its own national currency. Um, and some countries don't even really have a strong national currency. They, they use the dollar. Um, so that's just like centralization. And I think all of you are here because we're interested in um, local solutions where we actually have more power ourselves. Um, so there's also a history of a real diverse, diverse systems of money. And um, I think everybody knows about barter. And there are also time banks. And there are a lot of examples right here of different solutions that are um, a way, way of looking at this tool and saying, okay, we have different goals. How can we design a currency that's going to meet those goals? Um, and uh, one example from the past that I'd like to just point out quickly is um, in the U.S. in the late 1800s into the early 1900s, there were actually a system, there was a system of uh, local banks that issued banknotes that were real local currency, and they issued them, um, and they were only good in their region. And the kind of the the why and the how of and or why why and the when of issuing that those banknotes were based on local bankers making decisions about which entrepreneurs to to issue credit to, which entrepreneurs to issue new money to, and um, oh okay. Still <laughs> Um, and, and for what products. So it all depended on local knowledge. And so there was actually a system where people were issuing money, new money, like not backed by anything except the future production of that entrepreneur making something that the banker had confidence there was a market for. So um, even though we are kind of inculcated into this centralized banking system and we are used to having one currency, um, I just like to remind everybody that we have a lot of diversity in our past, and we have some really great models in our past, and we also have really interesting examples of um, different currencies nowadays. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the currency that I work on, which is in Berkshire County, Massachusetts, um, and it's called Berkshires. So I live in, uh, oops, sorry, I forgot something. So when you're asking what, what kind of currency are you going to create or what, how do you want your tool to be designed, you have to ask what kind of economy you want. So do you want one that looks like this, which is what happens in my county. We, we uh, do a lot of logging. We send the logs to Canada, and they get milled, and then they come back, and we build houses with them. And so that means that all those jobs are milling and uh, are not, here, not in the Berkshires. And... Um, all of that fuel cost happens along the way, sending the logs away, sending them back. Or do you want uh, an economy that looks like this, where there's a local, uh, in this case, portable sawmill with a local sawyer who knows his trees, and he knows the trees of the Berkshires, and he logs, mills, and sells the milled boards, or builds tables with them. Um, do we want a, a clothing industry that looks like this, where you're sending <laughs> clothes from all over the world to all over the world, um, mostly produced in places where you don't have to pay very much for labor. Or do we, and they're all made with petroleum products often. Or do we want one that looks like this, which is more circular, circular um, cyclical, and um, based in recyclable products? Um, so I'll tell you now about Berkshires, which um, I live in the Berkshires, which is in the western county of Massachusetts which is a very rural area, um, known for its beautiful landscapes, um, has very strong uh, history of people coming from Boston and New York to vacation there. So um, we have that kind of tourist economy largely now. But we also have a history of indus industry in um, paper mills and woolen mills, fabric mills, um, that were all based on water power of our rivers. Um, and employed a lot of people. And we have a really strong local business community uh, that has held on despite globalization. Um, and I think is largely d due to the uh, independent spirit that New Englanders have and are known, we're known for. Um, and our kind of do-it-yourself attitude. Um, and we have strong agriculture as well and great agricultural land and um, some really great uh, new businesses that are doing value-added products. 
So that's where I come from. And um, we have had a long history of experimentation with local currencies. So these are some real do-it-yourself currencies that were around in the Berkshires before Berkshires. Um, one is deli dollars, where a deli actually financed its own move from one location to another by issuing deli dollars. You could buy a $10 deli dollar with only $8 before the move, and then the owner could get, he got a bunch of money that he could spend on the new, on the new space, the renovation of the new space, and then the deli dollars could be redeemed after he was all set up in the new space. And um, he could write a valid after date on the deli dollars so that they wouldn't all come due at once. So he was issuing his own promissory notes and writing his own loan or payment plan. And it worked really well. Uh, he raised his money, I think, in two months and uh, moved on. And everybody always loved going to the deli. So deli dollars were actually used not just at the deli, but passed in the, the plate at church and all these different ways that they were <laughs> circulated. Um, and then the local farmers said, hey, we want to do that too. We need some startup capital um, to get going in the beginning of the season. So two, farmer, two farms issued deli, um, Berkshire Farm Preserve notes together, uh, Taft Farm and the Corn Crib, and they um, put a head of cabbage in the place of the, the usual place of the president's head. Um, and they, they were basically uh, asking for startup capital from their customers, and then the customers could come around once they had vegetables to sell and redeem their Berkshire Farm Preserve notes. Um, so those were forerunners to our currency, which is called Berkshires, um, which uh, if you're asking about, if you're thinking about structure and how do you want your tool to be structured, ours is a nonprofit organization that is democratically structured so anybody can be a member. Um, anybody who lives in the Berkshires can be a member for 25 Berkshires or $25 a year, and they can vote for the board or they can run for the board. Um, and it's place-based, so in the bylaws it says we're going to be uh, working in the Berkshire region. And this is a picture of our membership meeting a couple of years ago. Um, so this is what they look like. They're, um, you can actually buy them at local banks. Three different banks participate, and you can buy a Berkshire for 95 cents. So if you go to the bank, you, buy, you bring 95 cents, you get a Berkshire, you can spend it as if it was a dollar. Then it's convertible back to dollars if you want. Um, but there's an incentive to keep spending them. So we have about 400 businesses that participate, and you can, um, they're basically incentivized to keep spending them within that, circ within that um, network, because if they brought them back, they'd get only 95 cents on the Berkshire. Um, so they feature local heroes and our local landscape, and um, so they're not just a financial tool, but they're also a tool for building our regional identity and um, making you think about where you're spending your money because if you have Berkshires in your wallet, you can only spend them certain places. Uh, they have local artwork on the back um, and they are, have been around for nine years now. So anyway, I think I should stop talking about Berkshires <laughs> um, because I could go on forever, but we have time for questions later and I'd like to turn it over to our panelists to talk about different examples um, because this is just one system, and there are lots of different ways of organizing a local currency, and it basically depends on what you want to do uh, in order to uh, build your local economy. So I think we'll pass around Berkshires at the end. We have different examples. All of us have different examples of our currency. So um, Grace Murray, would you like to talk about downtown Truro dollars? Sure. So it's a very simple system, I think, very straightforward. Downtown Toro dollars um, are, are something that's been around in our town for a couple of years now. And we're finding them to be quite successful. Both the public and our downtown businesses both seem to be uh, embracing the system. But as I say, it's very simple. Um, perhaps I should first, though, give you a little background on who we are. Uh, when I say we are introducing programs, we are the Downtown Toro Partnership which is a not-for-profit organization that was introduced in 1979, so we've been around for a while. And our goal is to represent the general interests of the downtown business community, and we are funded by our downtown businesses. That's where the bulk of our, of our operating budget comes from. We have a number of uh, different things that we may work on uh, in a given year. 
Um, we have uh, been involved in such projects as major um, facade improvement projects. We have been involved in annual beautification projects or lobbying for initiatives like a new library in our downtown and dozens of um, marketing and promotional items and, and uh, events that are sometimes community-based, sometimes more business-based, and sometimes things that are pretty much exclusively business-focused, like downtown dollars. And I like to think of downtown Toronto dollars as a sort of an all-encompassing uh, initiative because those of you who may work with events uh, know that sometimes what works well for one sector of, of your economy or your downtown or whoever you're working with works better for, we'll say, the restaurants than it does for the jewelry stores or, you know, those kinds of things that it doesn't always work so well for everybody. Downtown dollars have the potential to be equal for all and everyone can participate. So if you can buy it with, as I say, good old Canadian cash, some days we wonder how good old Canadian cash how good it is, but if you can buy it with Canadian cash, you can buy it in downtown Toronto at a participating business just like you're using Canadian cash. There's no cost to the business to participate. There's, there's no, um, no money uh, has to change hands for them to be a participant. Um, the customer purchases the dollars directly from our office and uses them at participating businesses, and the business brings those dollars back to us, and we give them Canadian cash. Um, you may be asking yourself, why would I, why would I do that? Why would I go through that process? Why, why do I want to buy? What's the incentive for me to buy downtown dollars? Well, one thing we have found um, is that they, we call them the the gift for everyone and for every occasion, because they do make excellent gifts. If you don't know what to buy for Aunt Sadie or um, a, a, something for your hairdresser at Christmas or whatever. They're good for all of those things. And the recipient can then spend those dollars at one place or at a dozen different places, depending on what their choices are. Unlike a gift certificate that is for one specific business that they may or may not like, um, they've now got some options. They're um, also very useful for us as the sponsoring organization uh, as giveaways and prizes. And I'll just give you one example of something we did with them at Christmas time. We did what we called random acts of kindness. And we took um, random amounts of dollars, too, anywhere from 10 to $30, put them in sealed envelopes, and went downtown on different days, just gave out downtown dollars to people in stores or on the streets, and just said, thank you from your downtown business community for shopping locally. And people were like, really? Wow, that's great. Except for two people who said, no, no, I don't want them. We're like, well, you do understand. There was one in, one instance that I went and they were in a restaurant and they still hadn't paid yet for their lunch. And she said, no, no, I don't want them. And I said, well, you can pay for your lunch with them. You have not paid yet, have you? And she said, no. I said, okay, no pressure, we'll just move on. I went to the next table over there and I did my little spiel again and she says, that's fabulous, I can't believe it. And I said, I hope she's listening over there. <laughs> anyway, you can't please everybody, sometimes it just doesn't work. So we do have one other major incentive though that uh, gets people out and excited and that's that one day a year, usually during small business week in the fall, we do offer downtown dollars at 20% off. And you can imagine that goes over quite well because not every day that you can get money on sale. So <laughs> the first year that we did it, uh, we planned to uh, offer $10,000 at 20% off with a maximum individual purchase of $400. And I had no idea how this was going to go. I didn't know whether it was going to be a complete flop because people didn't get it or didn't care or just wouldn't show up. I spent a lot of money on advertising. Uh, a lot of people showed up and uh, we discovered very quickly that the $10,000 wasn't even going to take care of half of the lineup. So we made a decision right there and then and said, okay, let's offer another 10. And uh, in two hours, the $20,000 was gone. So 
The following fall, when we did the discount day, we offered $30,000 at 20% off, same $400 maximum per person, and it was gone in about three hours. It took a little bit longer, but um, it's, it's obviously, like I say, catching on. People are getting the, the idea and, and liking the idea of being able to support local. We sell the dollars the rest of the year uh, at face value, no discount, uh, from our office. So they're available any time. Um, but only one day are they available at a discount. And we're actually thinking this year of introducing a spring sale. Uh, probably in the next few weeks we'll, we'll offer a smaller amount. Um, I think we'll do $15,000 at 20% off, um, just as a little spring incentive. So uh, that's the discounting aspect of things. Um, some questions that we get from both customers and from businesses um, that I'll just run through very briefly. Uh, if the purchase is, if that, that you make with your downtown dollars, if the purchase is less than the amount of the downtown dollars, you get the change back in Canadian cash. So you're not losing any value on your dollars and the, the business is not losing any money because they're going to bring the downtown dollars back to our office and we're going to exchange them dollar for dollar. Um, back for Canadian cash. So no cost to them and no loss to the consumer who has has used them. We do print only smaller denominations, five, ten, and, and twenty dollar bills, so that we try to minimize the possibility of people, you know, spending um, giving a fifty dollar downtown dollar we'll say for a ten dollar purchase and then getting forty dollars back in Canadian cash that they can take and spend anywhere. We want the money to stay downtown, so we don't don't let there be quite that much fluid motion on it. Um, we've had people ask, do they have an expiry date? No, they're just like cash. There's no expiry date. Can I use them during a sale? You can use them during a sale, no no question. If the store or business or the, the entertainment venue or wherever accepts cash, they accept downtown dollars. And if you bought your downtown dollars on discount day, and got 20% off, and then uh, used them during a major sale like Boxing Day or sometime when things are 40 or 50% off, you're really getting a good deal. So people caught on to that concept quite quickly. We also know, though, that people, too, are spending them. Some people are buying them for gifts. Some people are buying them. I spoke to someone today just at lunch uh, who received some as a Christmas, uh, no, a wedding gift. And uh, she... Uh, she, was, she knew somebody in town that she could go and spend them with, and she was so excited. And I said, well, I, I've not heard of them being used as a wedding gift, but we said they're the gift for anyone at any occasion. But we know, too, that people are spending them to buy, we'll say, something that they knew they were going to get anyway. Perhaps it's a nice bike, but maybe they upgraded the bike a little more if they got the dollars at, at discount time, or they bought some accessories to go with it or whatever because we are hearing that from some of the businesses that the, the customers are commenting that, well, I got, I got sale money here, so I'm going to buy some more things with it. <clears throat> That's the kind of thing we like to hear. To give you a few stats, um, the first year we had about 65 businesses that were accepting them. The second year we had about 85. And uh, before the spring sale, I will have up over 100 of them. Really, there's only a couple of things that, that limit that. One of that one, one of those things is the fact that there's only one of me, and I don't seem to be able to get to all of the people um, in time to get the brochure updated. There's always a dozen projects on the go at the same time, and it's the kind of thing that you really have to talk to the business one-on-one -on -one with for the most part and just explain it. It doesn't take long, generally. When they find out there's no cost involved, it's like, yeah, okay, I'm in. But uh, it, it is taking a little bit of time. So far, we have about $63,000 in circulation, and we have uh, about 53000 of that has been redeemed back from the businesses. Some of the businesses have seen nothing more than maybe $25 come through their door. Some of them have seen 2500 come through their door, and some of them have seen nothing. But again, it hasn't cost them anything, and their name is included in the brochure as a downtown supporter. So it's, it's something that we find is, is working well. It's not only an economic um, factor, I guess. It's also something that seems to be creating a pride of place. People seem to be adopting the idea that this is an easy way for me to show that I, I do support local. And um, 
I, I guess the ease of the program is another part of its success, really. I think it's easy for sales, um, for, for businesses to incorporate it into their sales, for uh, employees to know how to accept them, for the public to know how to spend them, for us to know how to manage the program. So it's, in a nutshell, it's, it's an easy way for us to keep people thinking what, it, what, what we're all about, which is think downtown first. And so we encourage um, everyone to think downtown Truro first. But uh, sort of in, in uh, keeping with that, I'll do a little advertising. You may have noticed I have this orange bag here, and it says, enter to win one of two prizes of $50 worth of downtown dollars. Just drop your business card or your name on a scrap of paper, whatever, and we'll award two prizes of $50 in downtown dollars. If any of you think you may be visiting, we'll take your money, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I think one of the most, uh, one of the strengths of downtown dollars is that they are self-financing. Just like Michael Schumann was saying this morning, um, if you want to have a pollinator business that's going to be successful, you have to find a way to, for it to work financially. And downtown dollars has that built in so that you just build it into your budget every year and you... I think that's great. Um, so next, uh, we're going to hear from Michael Barton, who is an engineer turned local currency activist. <laughs> <laughs> the other way around, I'm sort of well. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> who works on the North Shore. Yeah. And I'll give you your mouse. Thank you, yes. Engineers like control. <laughs> So yeah, I'm from the North Shore Lats, which is based in North Shore of Nova Scotia. We're surrounded by sort of three bigger towns, Truro, Amherst, Pictou, and New Glasgow. And we, our idea is to kind of exclude those. It's a rural system. So, <laughs> no disrespect. They've got their own. <laughs> they have their own thing. So what does Lats stand for? I will move the slide. Otherwise, oh, can you? It's not working. There uh -huh. it was there, wasn't it? No? OK. <laughs> I did these on open office and some of it has disappeared, yeah. but anyway. So what does LETS mean? It stands for Local Economic Trading System. LETS is a bit like a barter network, but we have an accounting system. We use a, our own currency called LETS notes. Alice kind of explained why barter doesn't work that well, because you really have to match your needs and wants, and that can be a real impediment to training, trading. On LETS, you don't have to do that. We've got an accounting system, so if, if I trade with someone who doesn't want what I offer, we can still trade. So it opens things up. You'll understand more when I talk a bit more about that, I think. So where does let's come from? Thank you. It was invented by Michael Lynn, who lived in a small town in BC called Courtney. In the early 80s, there was a recession there. And he was inspired by commercial bar networks that operate on a for-profit basis. But it's, there's lots of networks like that with large businesses. They have a surplus or something. They don't have a lot of cash, so they trade their surpluses. And the, for it to work better, just like on LADS, there's an accounting system, so they don't have to match. OK, I've got 5,000 widgets, and I need screws. But you don't have screws, so we don't trade, right? But if someone else on the system has screws, then the person can get their screws from, from the person that has them, if you follow what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so he was inspired by that. And the idea is, though, that it's a nonprofit and it's community-based, so it's a, to help people in the community. It's not a business-to-business -business network, which is for profit. In the meantime, hundreds of systems have sprung, around, sprung up around the world, and ours is one of them. So what is a let's note? As I said, the let's note measures the value that people place on the goods and services they trade. For the moment, for simplicity and to make the system more understandable, we've, we're working on a system of parity, so one let's note is worth one federal dollar. We have an accountant on the system with a storefront, which is great, gives it some credibility. And originally on the system we were trading with checks, which is the upper item there. And so members to trade would write a check to another member. So if I was buying from someone, I'd write them a check. Eventually, the checks would be taken into the accountant. He would credit the account of the seller, and my account would be debited. And so it's just like a bank, except it's run by the community, you know, by our accountant in this case. 
And lately we've started printing paper money. So that's a, an example there, and I'll talk about that in a second too. So the Let's Notes can be spent, originally they were only on the system, so that if you earned Let's, you'd look for another member who's offering something you wanted and you'd spend there, or you'd hold on to them and spend them later. It means that Let's Notes are more flexible than barter, but not as flexible, say, as Canadian currency. My interest in Let's was that I I'm always looking at things from the lens of ecological sustainability and I realized at some point that there couldn't be sustainability without local currencies. If your economy is controlled by an outside supply of money, then you can't really make it ecological and local. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Unless members can trade even when cash is hard to come by. So as I said, you're not tied to a supply of these Canadian dollars that are worth something, maybe sometimes, depending. So I explained how the checks work. And it's just like a bank check, except it's a community bank really responsible. These systems are called mutual credit. On our system, all accounts start at zero and people who join have a $200 credit limit or 200 let's not credit limit. They circulate within the community, and Let's Notes are never spent at Walmart. <laughs> There's like two butt bullets missing on that one. That's interesting. It's <laughs> oh, there they are. Later. <laughs> oh, I see. That's weird. Anyway, <laughs> so it's better than cash. <clears throat> so as I said, Let's Notes can't be spent at Walmart. And they always circulate locally, so they produce, produce local employment and production. And most interesting, there's never a shortage of let's notes. In a system like this, which is mutual, mutual credit, people can trade as much or as little as they want. They're not tied to a supply, how much, how much money is out there. We can't trade, there's no money. People want to trade, they trade. So the money supply expands and contracts as, as it's needed. So it's pretty cool. So how do... People know what's available. On our system, we have a web website where every member has a list of their offers and wants, and we also have classified ads, so we send out updates with the latest on the system. Thank you. <laughs> and members, we have a few members who don't have web access, don't do e email, anything like that, which is totally fine. For them, we have a paper directory. So who can use Let's? Local businesses are on the system, nonprofit and volunteer groups, and all kinds of individuals. Our philosophy is that everyone is welcome. So on the North Shore, how is our let's set up? It's a volunteer-run nonprofit project of a large organization called the Sunrise Trail Community Development Co-op, which is also a nonprofit co-op. It's kind of like our local environmental organization. The system's been around since 2006, we have about 60 counts right now, which is a community of about 100 people. Over $100,000 worth of Let's Notes have been traded. Right now the system has tradespeople, restaurants, a bakery, engineers, two retreat centers. <laughs> Our system, the, it, it's funded by uh, one of the other projects of the Sunrise, Sunrise Trail Co-op, is documentary movie nights that are shown about once a month at present. Donations from that go to fund our system. Some systems charge transaction or membership fees. We don't have any fees. So far we've managed with those donations. And now we're doing something new because let's, we have a very strong system, but with those 60 members we were tied before to trading only amongst each other. So we've been printing currency with the idea that it'll broaden our base. Anyone can use a printed note. If someone does me a favor, does a bit of work who's not a Let's member, I can pay them with a Let's note. And they can then give it to someone else who's also not a Let's member. So they circulate much wider. They're also, printed notes are good advertising. If you make a note very beautiful, it's good for the tourists to buy them. And it just highlights what's, what's available on the North Shore and our system. 
Now, when you're printing or putting out paper money, the issue is always, okay, what's backing it? You know, you can all go, go home, fire up your printer, print a block of money and say, okay, I gotta <laughs> give you this. And it's, of course, it's worthless, right? So in our system, all the notes are backed. We sell some for, our accountant actually sells them for $1 per let's note. And the value of that, the federal dollars are banked for and we, what we call the let's redemption fund. So if businesses have sp trouble spending or something like that, we have that backup. They can come to us and they can cash out kind of like the book shares. The other way the notes are issued, though, is from credit. So if a member wants to have notes just because they're more convenient and wants to spend them, they can take, the, take notes out based on their let's credit in their account, which is really the way it works with the bank. If you want to get cash notes, they take it out of your bank account, right? So same idea. So the question is always about taxes. <laughs> In Canada, Revenue Canada actually recognizes barter if it's part of your primary profession, whatever you're doing as a business, you have to charge HST and it's, the revenue is taxable. If you're doing something as a sideline or trying something out, it's not taxable. So that's an advantage, actually. Uh, the LET system doesn't, we don't, we don't collect information, we don't report anything on the members, it's their responsibility. Once someone joins, we tell them that's how it works, it's your responsibility. So the ecological aspect, which is always kind of my thing. Let's trade benefit the environment because they reduce transportation distances. They encourage the reuse and recycling of local goods. They increase accountability because people on the system know each other and there's a sense of trust. If something's been grown locally or made locally, you have a much better sense of what was involved than if it came from wherever, right? It also encourages local self-sufficiency because you're always focused more in your local community, this LUTS community or the local community where you can trade with the notes. Much rather than if you have Canadian, you could spend it locally, you can spend it somewhere else, go to Walmart or whatever. So that's kind of just a little nudge, and I think that's important though. And Alice asked us to talk about our vision for the system. So I said LUTS is kind of a system that works only with its members. Right now we have about 100, which is some theorists say that's the ideal size for a community. You can know, know a bunch of 100 people fairly well and know what they're doing and what they're about. So that's actually a good trading group. But of course, say North Shore of Nova Scotia, just in the town of Boucher, we've got over 10,000 people. So we want to have a bigger impact. So that's one reason we're doing the nodes. So ideally, what I'd like to see is a bunch of little nodes, sort of almost like neighborhood things, where that's where a system of members and trading circles, that kind of thing happens, but the nodes have a broader base and having a significant impact on the local economy. That's kind of my vision for the system. Thanks. So the tax question might seem like, oh yeah, taxes, but it actually is really important for local currency systems because uh, the tax structure is different in different countries um, and it can really influence the way you set up the system. And for example, let's haven't taken off in the US because there's a different tax system um, that would put the burden largely on the let system to report um, rather than here where it, the burden is on the business owner. Um, and maybe it's just been that in the U.S. nobody's pushed hard enough to make it work. Um, but I think uh, that's something to consider um, and a good point. And, uh, and Ryan might talk about that too. But um, the other piece is the trust part and the, the way that in the let system, it's actually allowing people, allowing communities to control the money supply, which is something that ties in really well with Ryan's CredX system. Would you like to tell us? Yes, absolutely. Uh, CredX is a IOU tracking system. Um, it's a, a web-enabled IOU tracking system, and it's it's uh, actually a kind of get a kick out of calling it an alternative to currency because there's nothing that circulates like a currency. It's just a, a individual exchanges of IOUs. So every CredX transaction <coughs> uh, represents an exchange of value between two people who trust each other. Um, <coughs> it's, it, uh, <coughs> it's very related to let systems that actually uh, uh, came, the, the spark of it came about 10 years ago as I was researching let systems and like, how does this, how does this money thing work and what's the alternatives? And, 
and um, and it's it's like it's let's with a bit of a twist, uh, and the twist is the 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 individualization of every transaction. It's always between two people. Um, it has a software component, and that was a big barrier to getting things going. But over a period of about eight years, it, this idea just like wouldn't let go of me, and uh, and so eventually it just got to the point where I like, okay, I've, I've got to do this. So we tried it out uh, about a year ago, and I just uh, invited um, a few friends. There were eight of us in the first pilot, uh, and we just got together and we brought snacks and we brought pencil and paper and I just said, we'll forget the half a million dollars in software development, we'll just use a pen and paper. And at the end of the session, we'll just, we'll, 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 so we'll test it out uh, 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 and at the end of the session, we'll, we'll uh, wipe the slate clean. So this will just be a test run. And uh, so everyone brought snacks, fruit, trail mix, baked goods, whatever, and we just traded back and forth. And we had it was like a little snack break, we ate our snacks and we like bought, someone bought, an apple and you know, buy a brownie and write an IOU for like IOU three cred and buy the pair with that. Uh, and then at the end we did a little like a reconciliation of the accounts and we looked at where all the different loops of value were, were, were occurring. Someone's getting a pair, that person's getting a brownie, that person's getting some trail mix and that's a loop of everyone providing value which is what the system is all about. It's all about creating um, circulation of economic value. And so after that, we, we said, it works, what's next? Let's do it again, but let's do the real thing. Let's not, uh, let's not wipe the slate clean at the end of the event, let's just keep track of these balances. Um, so we did that four times between uh, like March and May or something, I think it was May of last year, twice in Halifax, twice in Blockhouse, near Mahone Bay on the South Shore. Um, and, uh, and it kept working, I did a, uh, the, this next phase included um, a Google spreadsheet where we were tracking all the all the balances. So there was a little checks. This, these are the ones for the. Do you mind? Sure, these are the let's checks that that that, uh, well, that um, Michael's uh, system uses. But we had a, a similar, actually much less pretty even than this nice little black and white one. Uh, so people would exchange at these marketplaces, and then they would hand their checks in to the central, the accountant basically, and they'd en get entered in these Google spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet would, there was a, someone who'd, who'd written some co code to find these loops. <coughs> um, <coughs> and that hit capacity at about uh, $2,500 worth of transaction. And, um, and at that point, we started developing the, the database structure uh, a little more. We tested that uh, in November. And, uh, and it worked as well. It was, uh, cred was sent by email, so you would just send an email and you would copy send.credx.org and the system would process it and send, send the receiver an email and say, you've got cred, would you like to accept it? Uh, and, but the interface was kind of clunky. So the, our next phase of development, um, which has been ongoing at a much slower pace due to, to personal issues that have come up and, and um, volunteer issues, uh, has been to develop the user interface so that the thing will work and be more user friendly, which is the next slide. Can you? So this is our, just the graphical concept of your, your accounts, your ledger. So each IOU you've issued and how much of it you've made good on. Uh, <clears throat> the, the way that the, the, the way that the system works is, um, is that every, every transaction is a, is an exchange of value and it's an IOU. So if I'm going to buy apple cider from Michael um, and he has it, he, he, I will offer him this IOU and he will accept it if he trusts me. And he could trust me because he knows me or he could trust me because he knows I have a lot of value to offer to the economy and the community or he could trust me because he uh, has access to a, a summary of my history and he can say, oh, you've made a lot of, you've issued a lot of IOUs and you've made good on them so I will trust you even though I don't know you. And that's indicated at the, on the top of this uh, thing, there's an account health, the blue bar just to the right of Adam's picture, your account health. So that's like issued a lot of cred, I've made good on a lot of cred. So he can see that about me and then decide to trust me. <clears throat> um, and then, uh, so then he, if, he, if I have something he wants, then he could like buy my coffee mug for five cred back. And the system will say, oh, those, those five cred has been issued on either side and it will redeem that. 
So I've received five credit value. He's received re received five credit value. Um, that's a that's equal, uh, <clears throat> and it will erase that value. It'll mark them as redeemed. Now the the extra trick though is that that's not all that helpful in because the ch the chances of exchanging back and forth are pretty low. So what the system will do it will find larger loops. So if Michael wants instead of my coffee mug wants to buy Grace's coffee mug then he can do that for five lets and if she wants my coffee mug then I can exchange that for five for five uh, five cred and the system will find that loop as well so so everyone in that loop has has offered something of value and received something of value and the system will find that and mark it as redeemed and balance those accounts uh, <clears throat> So that's the, the basic concept. Um, and the, the intention of the system is that it's very simple to start up. So once the, the basic infrastructure is built, the next phase of it, it will be easy for anyone to join. So a community or an individual could just start using it and it will, it, the system will start finding loops within that economic community. So we, we have a... <clears throat> There's a little cluster in Halifax right now of people who've traded with each other, and there's a cluster in Blockhouse and Mahone Bay area, and then there's a lot of cross-pollination where people have come down to the South Shore for one of their marketplaces or come back and forth, and those are all tracked as well. And, and the idea here is that not to establish a, uh, <clears throat> a contained currency, but to be able to see where value is flowing, and then to use that data to, to influence decision-making about how do we keep value flowing so and identify issues. So if the issue is that a lot of value is flowing from uh, Blockhouse to Halifax and not being returned, then we we use the data to try to figure out how can that value circulate back because it's in everyone's best interest that the money flows, that the cred flows, that everyone is receiving and, and gaining value in, in, any, in any currency or trading system. Um, if, if the value sticks at any point, <clears throat> if people are accumulating too much uh, in one spot, the whole, the whole system gets fr frozen up. So it's in everyone's best interest to find those ways to, to circulate. And it also makes it very easy for a community or a small group or sub-community to just start trading because all you have to do is open an account and you can, you can get going with it. Um, even at this point, even if you, if, if you send an email to someone uh, and copy send at credx.org, then they will get an email that says, they'll get your email and they'll get another email from the system that says, uh, Joe wants to send you 16 cred. Do you accept it? This is how you open your credit account and if you accept, click here. So it's very simple and the system will then start to find loops within your exchange circle. Um, <clears throat> it's a, it's a, unincorporated nonprofit at this point. There's a, uh, our November gathering, this most recent gathering was focused a lot on governance. So that there's a, there's a democratic governance structure. Uh, and one of the, the key reasons of that to, to do that was to, um, to put certain decisions in the hands of the community. Like the system is funded by a fee, a percentage fee on each transaction that fee is, uh, is controlled by the community through a democratic process. So I put forward a proposal and the, then that, uh, that governance process uh, made the decision about, and, and will again be able to review that decision and, uh, and decide does this make sense or what's it, you know, what's it being used for? Does it, what's the best thing for us to do here? <clears throat> um, and there's a lot more areas to go into, but maybe I'll leave it at that for now and uh, <laughs> see what questions come up. Thank you. Did you go back to the last slide on my slide too? Um, I wanted to just circle back to what um, Michael mentioned, which is thinking about the long-term uh, vision of each of these currencies um, and just ask our panelists to kick us off for the questions and answers. Um, ask you each, well, Michael, you already kind of hit on it, but if you, if uh, Ryan and Grace would like to talk about your long-term vision for these currencies. Go ahead. 
Um, we can definitely answer that. Why don't we just come back to it, though? Because we, we, we have answers to that question. Um, so long term, uh, I'd say that we've been really going with a, a process, of, um, an approach of experimentation. It's a lot of ambition. It's a pretty ambitious project. It's also pretty humble in that like, we don't know if this is really going to work or is it going to keep working or how is it scalable. And, um, and so the, the vision is that it will replace uh, a system that's not working so well for communities and, and economic participants and Main Street with one that is working better and is, is controlled by a more direct uh, democratic process. Um, and we'll see where it goes. And it, and it, and it is a, a it, there isn't a geographical limit. So it could be global, there could be nodes, there could be Nova Scotia, it could be local communities within Nova Scotia, there can be a community in Europe or in South America start up and there's no, um, all of that is, is organic. So I guess the long-term vision is that those start to happen and start to grow and then start to transact with each other and exchange values where appropriate Maybe that's in the kind of durable goods category or something that was talked about this morning um, over those long distances when it makes sense to do so. Grace? I think I'd have to say that our vision is, um, well, because we, we represent a very, a very specific area, that being downtown Truro, uh, is, is to have essentially every business within that geographic area participating in the program. And there's a bit of education. I said there were a couple of reasons why that wasn't happening, and one of them is me. The other one is that um, it, th there's a bit of education in that some of the professional firms uh, tend to say, oh, well, I, I can't participate in that. I mean, you can't pay for your legal services or your insurance or your what have you with downtown dollars. And, and so you have to explain, well, why not? Do you accept cash? Well, yes, well then, it can be paid for with downtown dollars, it's, but, but right now they're not grasping that picture for some reason. We do have some now, who, we do have some insurance companies and uh, some other professional firms, chiropractors and that kind of thing, who are buying into the system. So I'd like to say that within um, a year or so, we'll have doubled the number of participants. Our downtown core represents about 300 businesses. and. Uh, and from the consumer side of things, to more and more be able to have them saying, oh yeah, downtown dollars, I have some, I know about it, I'm telling you about it, just to increase that awareness and, and the use, I think, will come. And, um, and, and the support local theme will continue. Um, I think that that's kind of the same, same goal for Berkshire's. Um, I was so breathlessly going through talking about Berkshire's that I forgot to, to talk about my own question, which was the long-term vision. Um, and so our vision is really to create a currency that can be backed again, as we used to have those currencies that were issued by local bankers for local production. We want to have a currency like that again in Berkshire County. And it would be complementary to the dollar, um, but we would like to have a currency that represents local production. So this is one of our... One of our business owners, Daniel Bello, who's a potter, uh, he produces beautiful pottery in Great Barrington, in the Berkshires. Um, and we have great farmers, and we have people who could make sa who make sauerkraut and cheese and furniture. So we'd like to actually issue loans in Berkshires to small local businesses that can use those loans to start up. So you're issuing a little bit of money to create a lot of production um, so that our currency would actually be backed by that production. Um, so that's our, our goal, and, and along the way, we would like to increase the number of businesses that take Berkshires and, um, and increase the education about spending, why it's important to spend your money locally. Um, so maybe we should go back to that question, the very practical question of how do you prevent fraud um, and counterfeiting. And should we, we circulate have a, them, Ellis? Yeah. yeah, let's yeah. do that. Yeah, and we're recording this session, so we could just... Might all try and run around and get everybody, but yeah, it might not amplify your voice that much, but it's actually for the recording. What's that? So, um, who wants to talk about counterfeiting first? <laughs> well, we have, oh, sorry, we have a very basic system, uh, as you'll see when, when the dollars circulate, 
Uh, it's very hands-on as well. Um, another thing I have to do, we uh, emboss uh, each and every dollar uh, after it's printed with uh, a stamp that says Downtown Toronto Partnership. And so when they come back to us, if they're not embossed, well, we haven't had any of that happen, but that would be our, our, our safeguard. And Berkshires were printed on paper that was um, made by Crane, Com Crane and Company, which is the leading producer of currency paper for, I think, many countries in the world. Um, and they're in the Berkshires, so we're lucky enough that they had, we knocked on their door and they had a bunch of paper that used to be used for U.S. currency and that wasn't being used anymore, so we got to use that. So it has really high quality paper um, and high quality intricate printing. Uh, and we've only had one instance of counterfeiting, which was pretty easily caught because it just didn't feel like the right paper. And we were able to go back to the, the Berkshire Co-op market where that had come in and give everyone a cashier pen, a uh, um, currency pen, and that could that pretty much nipped it in the bud. Well, Alice, what does a currency pen do? Um, if you put the currency pen across a real piece of a real uh, dollar, it will not change colors. Mm. But if you put it across a fake, it will turn black. Oh, okay. Our notes are on linen paper also, which is hard to get. Uh, our local printer is Advocate Media, which is prints that actually in North Shore paper and Picto, and they were really into printing money. So we've got a good quality paper that's hard to get. Uh, we have serial numbers, and we actually track them at the moment. And as well, there's a little embossed gold leaf printing on there, which wouldn't photocopy, so it would be pretty hard to counterfeit them. As far as we know, no one's, no one's even tried yet. Yeah. And Credex is an entirely different. <laughs> it's like an entirely different question because it's uh, all electronic. So what if someone hacked your system? Y well, yes. <laughs> what if? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be the issue. No, it it's issue. more a computer yeah. security issue than a than yeah. a counterfeiting that issue. Makes sense. There's always something. Yes. Yeah. yeah my question was. Um, it seems like. Three of the things, one of these things doesn't quite blow. It's not like the others. So three of the things are actually currency systems, but what you're talking about, you said, was an alternative to currency. It, I use that phrase kind of just because it is, and creates questions about what that is, but I think it's also a very good descriptor because it, it doesn't, it replaces money is the phrase that I, it's like, it, it replaces the uses of money with direct IOU transactions. So it does the exact same thing. It it serves the same, the same purposes, same functions, but it, it does because not it doesn't circulate. That's why I say it's not money. There's no if I issue you an IOU, you can't take that and give it to someone else. You I keep it. It always is yours, but you can issue your own to someone else. So it would always be between you and I. Then always, yeah. Between. So so that the trust is so if you accept mine, that that's that's the trust. You don't then ask someone else to trust me, who then at, like that just gets that would get very complicated very quickly. So it's kind of like where you put your trust because dollars you're supposed to put your trust in God, or, or the, the Federal, Federal Reserve. Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and then Berkshire's if we can create a local currency that's backed by local production, it'll be your trust will be in local production and your lo local producers. And in credits, it would be actually with the person you're trading with directly. Right, which is also a very similar idea of local. Um, it, it would just it's just decentralized version of that. It's based on the idea that you trust my ability to produce something of value um, that will circulate that, and that that value will circulate back to you. Um, so what I'm curious about uh, mainly were were I guess. I'm Duncan. Sorry, I promote good, clean, fair food. And what I'm what I'm curious about is we're changing. We're hoping to change behavior around local currency purchasing. Um, and have you experimented with kind of more steady investments uh, from people like bank transfers, those kinds of things, where someone commits uh, to putting a lot of money potentially, uh, either monthly or yearly, um, into the system. Um, where they they make a conscious decision at one time and then they don't have to think about it because they're always paying into local dollars. Well, that sounds like downtown dollars, the discount days. Somewhat, um, but I think what you're talking about is different from from 
from what we're doing, um, if I understand you right, um, we do have uh, the discount day where, where people get to to have a, a discount on, on their purchase where it's, it's not face value, but... Uh, are you... Are you talking about long-term investments yeah. or bigger yeah, investments? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, yeah. no, we're, you know, we're say, not. You know, like I, I subscribe to a CSA um, mm -hmm. where I get yeah. vegetables uh, throughout the year because I invest at the beginning of the year. Um, and I was just curious about, are there any systems in place for, like, say I wanted to put $300 a month into my local dollar system. Yeah. Um, how would mm -hmm. I do that consistently and not even have to think about it on a regular basis? It's it's definitely something that I've considered a lot of. Um, uh, basically, you would buy, like if you're buying cred in a sense. Um, so because there there will be always, <clears throat> not always, I should say, ambitiously not always, but in any kind of startup phase, there'll be places where a business will accept a bunch of cred and then not be able to spend it. So it's just sitting there and they're going to have to say, well, I'm sorry, I can't accept that anymore because I can't do anything of value with it. So you need to you need to uh, you need to have a, a release of that kind of pressure within the system, and so that can be there's a few ways that that could happen. That could be um, that business could make a loan to another business um, to that's just going to operate in cred, uh, or could give a gift to some kind of community um, purpose or charitable purpose, or uh, what would be uh, a huge boost to the system would be to have a reserve of Canadian dollars that had been achieved basically through a foreign exchange. So if you are paying $300 a month and getting 300 cred per month, then those the, that all that money from all those investments, the different people who want to support the system is held in like a foreign exchange bank. And then when that business says, I can't spend all my cred, can I get some dollars out because I need to pay my suppliers or my taxes or whatever, then there's a pool of, of money for them to get at it, which makes it much easier sell for a business or anyone if they feel like oh there's a like if, if I get stuck with a bunch of cred I can I can I can get uh, something that's more widely accepted something that will allow me to access so very much uh, thinking along those lines yeah. I think that there are currency systems around the world that have that kind of automatic debit to your account like Bristol pound is um, largely digital they have a paper currency but it's mostly used digitally, and so they have, like, you could set it up so every month you get 100 Bristol Pound put into your Bristol Pound account from your regular Pound account. And then I think the USCO, which is in the Basque Country, they have events, like, at the schools where they get the kids' parents to buy USCO yeah. regularly. So that's a good, I mean, that's a really good strategy, I think, to yeah. keep people using it. <coughs> or get them to use it. We're doing a couple of things that kind of relate to that. Like Ryan was saying, we've been selling these notes for federal currency. It's one way that it's issued. And right now we're banking that federal currency so that if a business has trouble earning, they can cash out. It, basically, we're trying to say to businesses, well, there's no reason you shouldn't join because you, if you have a problem, you can always just exchange it. You're back to square one, kind of with the true, like the true dollars. And eventually there'll be a big fund of money there, and some of that should be invested in the community, we're thinking, if that works out. And already, because we have a mutual credit system, a few business, small business startups have had extended credit, and we've extended them, say, $500 instead of 200 to help them with the startup, and so they can spend something on the system to help them get going. That's happened, and we'd like to do more of that on a larger scale, but right now it's just been a couple of times with $500. Cool. Thank you. The, Berkshire, the Berkshires, are they um, used just with local producers for locally made or grown items? No, and I should have brought the directory. We have an online directory, but we have a paper directory of 400 businesses and all different types. So you could get dentistry done. You could have excavating done. Um, you could go to your lawyer or your accountant, or you could buy from a local farm or sauerkraut maker. So all with Berkshires, so there's a real diversity. Okay, but you could also buy something in a store, but oh, it's yeah. not a local product. It mm -hmm. does come, but it's supply. It's supporting the local business. Yes. And so yeah, we have okay. we have a really great downtown Great Bar in Great Barrington, which is the kind of the South County hub, and there's lots of Berkshires businesses there, lots of retailers, and they actually they were the ones who piloted the first Berkshire notes in the early '90s. They did the merchants after they saw the 
Berkshire Farm Preserve notes and the deli dollars, they mm -hmm. said, hey, we want in on this too. So they, they did a Berkshire note that was like a discount uh, promotion over the summer for retailers. So we have lots of retailers too. Mm -hmm. um, question for Toro, why would a business not join? Well, really it's a case of education. Um, I don't know how many of you have uh, email lists, for example, that you use to um, contact people, they are, um, they're, a, they're a great asset, except they don't always get you the results you want because, you know, uh, some people are too uh, busy to uh, read them. And, and so, as I say, part of it is that you, I have to follow up basically with those I don't hear from one-on-one. -on -one. And very seldom, I don't, think I've had anybody actually say, no, I'm not going to participate. There is a bit of, of, as I said, a bit of a learning curve with some of the professionals that you have to get past because for some reason they think uh, downtown dollars could never be used to, to do something as, as serious as pay for your <laughs> will or your insurance or whatever. And like, I was talking to one of our insurance companies last fall and uh, he said, okay, I think I understand. I'm not sure why we wouldn't be able to do that. And I said, no, I don't either. Uh, Rod, I'm sure you could do that. And he said, well, how do I get my money back? I said, you come three doors down to our office and, and bring it in to me, and I'll give you cash. And he said, okay. Yeah, I don't see any reason why I couldn't do that. But it takes a little time sometimes to get them to understand. But really, there isn't any reason for them not to participate. There's no cost to them. And as I've said to some of them, if you never have a dollar, a downtown dollar come through your door, what if you lost? You've been included in the brochure, as so it gives you a little bit of, of publicity, a little bit of, of uh, uh, indication that you are a support local kind of business. And they get it, for the most part. It's, it's a learning curve and a time management thing for me. Well, he's and, in the insurance risk management yeah. business, so. <laughs> and Michael, um, your, your participants then are just um, people who live in Blockhouse or people who live in Halifax. This, the Ryan? Ryan. Ryan. So, uh, so far, yes. No, Adam, the designer, who, who you saw his picture up there, is in Montreal or Toronto. He found us on Facebook and wrote me and I was like, yes, we actually are looking for a designer. And so, <laughs> but other than that, yeah. And it has been dormant for about six months now. Uh, well, actually, no, longer than that. Um, nine, ten months. And then a little bit happened over the summer, but there was no marketplaces or anything. And that's, that's, uh, that's due to both developing the um, focus on the development of the, the infrastructure, the software, and also just uh, personal time and, uh, and volunteer hours what issues. What do you mean by the marketplace? Physical marketplaces where we went, where we had uh, we had four of them: two in Halifax and two in Blockhouse. So all of the all of the offers are in person, but the uh, accounting's online. Uh, so far, yes. And the idea would be that you would ha you could access it on your phone, so you could just like do it at a farmers market, or the vendor could just have a phone that you could like sign in on, and you could do the <laughs> transaction that way. Um, and uh, there's there's a couple uh, <coughs> businesses using the exchange as well, um, and being an accountant, I'm helping them like people understand how it works and what the tax implications are and and uh, <coughs> and that kind of thing. So uh, so that continue that has continued on over the summer, last summer. Do we have other questions? This question is for Grace. Um, with regard to your sale of, um, of your Truro dollars, there seems to be a 20% shortfall because if you're selling them for 80% off and the store, the store would be bringing it in and getting 100% value, are you, is your organization making up that shortfall? Yes, I should have mentioned that actually. I had it in my notes but missed it. Um, we do cover that. Uh, we build it into our budget for the year of what what events we're going to do and, and set an amount and, and a number of times that we're going to do it. And we figure that it's a, a good investment uh, in getting people to spend their money locally and in sort of giving back to the businesses um, a direct 
uh, a direct result because, as I mentioned, we are primarily funded by that downtown business core, by those businesses. So this is something they can easily see as a benefit to them uh, of using their money. Super. I had a similar question, actually, just about the 95 cents to the dollar in the mm -hmm. states. What? How do you account for that? And I mean, uh, we can see in the talks that we heard that um, it's like 2.4 um, uh, times generated economic mm -hmm. um, impact when you're purchasing locally. But is that how you justify it? Or well, actually, it doesn't really it doesn't really go anywhere. The five percent. Um, it's just 95 cents will go into the bank and they're backing the Berkshire that's out. Um, and then you can spend it as if it was a dollar. So you'll get a 5% discount if you're the one who goes and buys the Berkshires. Um, and then the, if the, the kind of genius part of it is that if the business keeps spending the Berkshire and doesn't come back to the bank to convert it, then they've given a discount without giving a discount. Like the, the customer's gotten one without the business giving one because the business can just keep spending the Berkshires with any of the other businesses. But if the business does go back to the bank um, with the Berkshire and they get basically 95 cents on that Berkshire, um, they have they have given a discount. So they can just, they actually can write that discount off as a business expense, as a marketing expense. Um, and then we hope that it will be made up for by extra business, but it can come right off the top of their taxes. So the only place it, Actually, there is a difference in above five percent is um, if you go back to the bank with the Berkshire. Um, so it's kind of like that's why you'd be much better to keep spending it. And do you think is, does that happen a lot? Um, it depends on the business owner. Um, there are some business owners who will never go back to the bank with the Berkshire. They've they vowed that they won't, um, <laughs> even if they sell bikes for thousands of dollars or for thousands of Berkshires. Um, they find ways to spend the Berkshires because there's so many places to do it. And then there are some businesses that go directly across the street to the bank and deposit their, <laughs> change their Berkshires into dollars. So the ones that vow never to turn it in really get it. Yeah. They really get it. Yes. And then there's some who, who really get the marketing aspect of it. They mm -hmm. really want to be the face of local businesses and local cheese and local sausage and everything. But they go right back to the bank and they deposit it. But they, they just say, you know, it's worth the 5% for marketing, for the sake of the marketing that we get. Um, and they don't want to go through the, the problem of, you know, it's so hard to think of where they're going to spend that. So. It doesn't matter who answers, but what is the education process? Like, I, it's good to say buy local, buy local, buy local. But what is the education process but to the citizens, to the businesses? How do you, like, I, I'm interested in doing that in my community. How, it's time consuming. Mm -hmm. It's time consuming to go and do that. So, and I'm doing 12 other projects. How do I, you know, how do I do that? <laughs> it is time consuming. Michael, do you want to start? Yeah. For us, we, the system's been most successful. It started with a, the guy who actually founded the system and set up a little committee, had a natural food store in Tatamagouche, and that was kind of the base for the system. And so he would, when people would come in and, Spended his story, he said, well, why don't you do that on Let's? So that was great. And then he actually closed up shop and moved away, but this, we kept the system going. And then the, a kind of private club opened up, and it sort of seems to be the place where everyone who comes in, who's new to Tatamagush, goes there, talks to the owners and things. And so we got a lot of new members that way, and that was kind of our, out, and our outreach coordinator, actually, was one of the owners of this club, so that was perfect. And I think it's really good to have a physical space. Right now we don't, and I think we're, we're missing it. I'm trying to do something with the farmer's market in Tatamagush because it's a natural mix, but there's some politics there anyway. But I think a physical space is, is great because people come to you and then you can sort of talk to them at, you know, at that point. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have to outreach to group, community groups or business associations. You know, that's what I'd say. Yeah. What about you, Alice? Um, well, for the Berkshires, it's been really essential that we work with banks and because if we were just doing it on our own, we would have to set up the exchange points, work with whoever was going to exchange, make sure that they were they had a bunch of safe money and um, they could do all the accounting, um, and that we would be visible in the community. And it, that would be expensive to pay for storefront space, especially because we have just tons of little tiny towns everywhere. So instead, we have banks who are like our storefronts, 
And that's been really essential as our physical kind of uh, face to the community. They have really beautiful framed versions of the Berkshires in their branch offices, and they have materials there for people who are buying Berkshires. So that's been really great because it's like a free advertising storefront. When you say three banks, it's not three branches, but it's three. It's seven branches okay. of three different banks. Yeah. Um, and then it's also been, it's, it's constantly evolving. So when we started, it was really the message was buy local. And that was in 2006. And I think we've evolved beyond that now. So now we have to kind of figure out what our, how do we get a concise message across that moves us further. Um, and one thing I've been doing that's been really fun and successful is the business of the month story. And you can find them. Like, if you're interested in what kind of businesses take Berkshires and seeing the broad range, I've been profiling different businesses. Every month I, write, I talk to a different business. So that's what this photo is from. Dan Bellow was the business of the month. Um, and so that I print in lots of papers. We, got on the, we get on the radio. Uh, and so that's been consistent. Um, and the best thing about it has been that I'm not saying it. It's not me <clears throat> making the pitch or, or like saying why buying local is great because I can say that all day, but if, I mean, they're going to get tired of it. <laughs> Everybody's going to get tired of hearing me do that. So instead, I just interview the business owners who are doing it and they say exactly what I want to say, but better because they have real experience doing it. And it's like, it's really fun for me, but it also, it, um, it kind of, wakes people up. I mean, they say, oh, well, like this guy who I respect really well is, is doing it already and, and he can explain why he is involved with Berkshire. So then I don't even have to do the work. I think too, word of mouth uh, is, is, a, is a primary mover and shaker. And if you can get uh, some of your key businesses, we'll say, um, on side, the ones who really get it, Mm -hmm. um, to help you with getting the word out. They all have websites. They all have Facebook accounts of, of customers. Uh, they all have, they're all tweeting. Everybody's into doing things that don't cost any money. And that gets the word out to a whole lot of different people than you perhaps are able to reach as quickly. Mm -hmm. And it will, it will help. It, we found it's working, beginning to work better for us when we start working with a, a small group of businesses that we can sort of control and say, okay, we know you get it. Uh, so if you could help us spread this word, uh, that'll be great. And, and then they're not just spreading it even business to business, but also to customers. And it's, it's, it helps because there's no question it's time consuming. Yeah. So you don't want it to be just you. Yeah. <laughs> So ask the right questions and collaborate and find ways that other people can tell the story, too. It's really As good. we were starting it, <clears throat> I did a lot of uh, personal invitations, set up a Facebook event, talked to people who use Facebook a lot. You know, will you invite? So, like, spread the word. We did this, this like, cred marketplace thing. So it was just for, the, it was like all the transactions happening there were with cred. Um, and then it became clear that the next that that what kind of wasn't the point that it, the point wasn't to like do a whole new thing and that's a pretty big ask to like come out on an extra night to do this extra thing so our next step was and is going to be when things are set up to go to the farmers markets set up a stall do some outreach i think it's actually i think a, 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 in in the case of of uh, credx in particular a really great um initial uh, adopters at the farmers markets would be the the intervendor um, transactions that happen at the beginning mm -hmm. and the end because yeah. they know and trust each Absolutely. other already yeah. and they can just they can uh, do those exchanges with cred and like you you know I'll get you next week and it'll it'll all balance out and this will track it so we don't have to all keep you know keep it in mind and from there you get a little sign that says you know cred X accepted here and the, and it can exactly. that's so that's kind I'm of the plan too. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it took a lot of work. It was like, yeah, a lot of outreach and conversation and messaging and figuring this and that, and it just did. <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions. <clears throat> and back to Truro. Um, so was it a lot of time to set up the dollars, or would that be maybe the easiest way to go about it? 
Well, as I say, when we first started, the first year, two years ago when we did it, we only had 65 businesses because there's always a deadline. I mean, you always have to eventually say, okay, I, I, we, we have to launch this. We, we can't wait any longer. And we were doing it in the fall, and, and that's absolutely my busiest time of year. And I may have managed to get 65 contacts made, and it's like, okay, we're launching this. That's respectable, I guess, for now. And, and now we're just building on it. And it is that making the contacts and, and, and that. As far as the dollars and, and getting to the public, that isn't nearly as complicated as growing your list of participants. And it's not that it's difficult to convince them. It's just, as she says, time consuming. And you're financed by? by the businesses within what is called the urban regional core. So within a boundary that delineates downtown Truro, those businesses uh, actually pay an additional tax on their commercial assessment that supports activities and initiatives for the downtown. And, and that is the case in, in many communities. Thank you. Maybe last question? I had a quick question for you, Ryan. Can the Credix community issue loans? Would that be possible? That would be, an, yes, that would be a next step that has a slightly, that is another layer of it, but yeah. that would be the ideal situation is when an accumulation of value happens, when someone's got a lot of cred in their account, and that one of the options would be to issue that as a loan to someone so who has business So you approach a member who has a surplus and ask them to use... Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. And I think in the early stages, it would be a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, like, noticing that, oh, this business is accumulating a lot of cred, and we should maybe go talk to them and see, like, how can we help you circulate that? What about a loan? If, if you, you know... So, and I, you know, I know this other little entrepreneur who's trying to start something up, and so making those kind of connections. I like how your, your currency is, like... The planning pollinator, the uh, well, because it's like you, you're you're tracking the, the flows of money, and then you could say, well, here's an opportunity for a business, and here's an opportunity. Right. So, and and you can make those connections and and kind right. of help the flows of the system because you have all that info, right? Which we won't we don't have with Berkshires because it's cash. We don't know who has it, when, where it goes, really. So. Yeah, someone um, this morning brought up the idea, like, or like the example of like if money is flowing out of a certain area because the in bread purchases because the baker there's no bakery or something, then that can be noticed and then that can be acted on by a local entrepreneur who says, oh, that's there's a, there's a gap there, and maybe that could then be funded, like you're saying, by a loan from another member and start as. It's like always about building loops in any of these currencies. I think it's it's if they, if they're going to circulate and succeed. It's either building loops within them or building the exchange, the direct exchange with the dollars so that they can, so that the value can flow that way. So, I do have a question. Then, so would both Berkshires, would Berkshires and perhaps the, perhaps the Truro dollars too, would either one of them benefit from being an app so that you can actually get to the tracking? Or would that deter people from actually using them? No, it probably would be a benefit. We just haven't gotten to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think there are drawbacks and there are major advantages to going digital. Um, we haven't done it because of funding and time commitment to developing it. Um, and also because we're working with three different banks. So if we built something digital, it would have to integrate with all three different banks, which have different mm -hmm. systems. and. So it, that would be a big, huge process, but it could also, and it, and but it could also be great because we could track better, um, and it would be more convenient in a lot of ways. But at the same time, we love cash because it's physical, and when you're handing money to somebody, it's a lot different than if you're sending something. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Except for the younger demographic, all about the digital. Yeah. Except for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming, and we'll, we'll be around, <laughs> so if you have more questions. <laughs>